Welcome back scholars. So this video is about empirical and molecular formulas and the math involved in finding these will give you some additional practice with molar conversions like the kinds of which we have been using so far for chemical reactions. And in fact, there's a chemical reaction that's commonly used to determine many of these empirical formulas. And it's not the only method, but it is rather common. And so it's worth going over as an example. And so in this example, a 10 gram sample of an unknown fuel. And so we've got 10 grams and this unknown fuel could be CX, HY, OZ. It could even have nitrogen or sulfur in it, but we're only told about some specific products here which are CO2 and H2O. And if we were going to have something other than carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in this compound, we know that combustion would also be producing NO2 and SO2, at least if we were assuming complete combustion, which we do assume for this type of question, which is known as combustion analysis. And since we don't have any NO2 and or SO2, we don't have to worry about nitrogen or sulfur in this compound. And what we're told about this particular fuel when it's combusted is that we form 19.11 grams of CO2 and 11.73 grams of H2O. Now we know from conservation of mass that this means the total amount of mass on this side is 30.84 grams, which means that there have to be 20.84 grams of oxygen coming into this reaction. But that doesn't really help us figure out what the formula is. That doesn't figure us out, help us figure out how much carbon or hydrogen or even perhaps oxygen are in the compound. But what we do know is that all 19.11 grams of carbon dioxide, the only source for that carbon in the carbon dioxide is from the fuel. And the only source for that hydrogen in the water is from the fuel. So even though the oxygen in the CO2, the oxygen in the water, even though that could possibly have come from the fuel, or it could have come from the air, and we don't know how much comes from each in the beginning, we will be able to do some calculations to figure this out. And so I'm gonna go ahead and take this away so that it's just the work up here, and kind of come backwards a little bit to say that even though the grams of CO2 we can take to grams of carbon, and the grams of H2O, we can take two grams of hydrogen. Even though we can do these things, the reason for doing so is so that we can figure out what the empirical formula is here. And the definition of an empirical formula is that it is a formula found from empirical evidence and empirical evidence you can think of as meaning experimental evidence. And so this empirical formula that we find will come from experimental evidence. Here we have got experimental evidence of this combustion analysis problem that we're looking at. And so we can use that information to figure out the formula. So one of the steps in doing this is to figure out how many grams of carbon and how many grams of hydrogen are contained in the grams of CO2 and the grams of water. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to convert. And to do these conversions, we really need to use the mole map. And if we think about the mole map, then we're gonna convert from grams of CO2 to moles of CO2. And this is a molar mass we've seen before. It's one that's common enough, it might be worth memorizing. Of course, you don't have to. You know how to find that anytime you like. 
Remember the second step here would be the molar ratio, which we're lucky here we have from the chemical formula of carbon dioxide. And in carbon dioxide, there's one mole of carbon for every one mole of carbon dioxide. And then our final conversion here would be to convert to grams of carbon to get our answer in grams of carbon. And the 11.73 grams of H2O, we would take through the same process, one mole H2O over 18.02 grams H2O times two moles of hydrogen for every one mole of H2O times 1.01 grams of hydrogen for every one mole of hydrogen. And as we go through and we do these steps, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and pause after I calculate the moles. And so on my own calculator, I'm doing 19.11 divided by 44.01 grams per mole, which gives me a value, a decimal, and then I multiply that by one over one. And so right here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pop out a number as a part of this work, because I know it's gonna be useful for me later. And what this number is right now is it's 0 0.4342, and I wanna go ahead and keep at least one extra sig fig, just so that I'm not rounding too much in the middle, so that happens to be a two, and right now this is my moles of carbon. And this is gonna be important later on. And I'm gonna do the same thing down here with the water once I get there but I'm gonna go ahead and multiply my moles of carbon now by the 12.01 to get 5.215 grams of carbon. So then I go to my water line and I have 11.73 grams of water that I divide by 18.02 grams per mole. And I get a decimal again, which I'm then gonna multiply by two over one so I find that I have 1.3019 moles of hydrogen. And then I multiply that by 1.01 to get my grams of hydrogen, which are 1.315. Now at this point, one of the things you should be noticing is that my grams of carbon and my grams of hydrogen don't quite add up to my grams of the fuel. And that's because the grams of the fuel is really equal to my grams of carbon plus grams of hydrogen plus grams of oxygen. So if you're doing this for a combustion analysis question and your carbon and your hydrogen do not equal the mass of the fuel, well then that means that you know that you have some oxygen there. And so this is just simply a subtraction at this point to get our grams of oxygen. And so our 10.00 grams of fuel minus 5.215 grams of carbon minus 1.315 grams of hydrogen equals, and again, 10 minus 5.215 minus 1.315 equals 3.470 grams of oxygen, but notice that my grams of fuel was only precise to the second decimal. So what ends up happening here is I basically lose a significant figure in this subtraction step. And if I take this 3.47 grams of oxygen and convert that to moles, then I will have moles of each of these elements, 
And in this case, the 2169 actually does represent an extra significant figure for the oxygen. So the reason why I want to do moles and why I want to get to moles for each of these elements is because my chemical formula, my empirical formula, is always a ratio of atoms. So when we're looking at an individual molecule and we're thinking about how many atoms there are of each of those elements in the compound, that means we need to be comparing the atoms of carbon and the atoms of hydrogen and the atoms of oxygen. Well, the easiest way to compare those, if we're not actually on the atomic scale, but if we're on the gram scale, is to use the mole unit rather than the atom unit. And so rather than trying to count with some huge exponents here, the numbers of atoms, we're just going to stick with moles. And what I'm going to do down here is I'm going to rewrite my moles of carbon. and my moles of hydrogen. When you look at these three numbers now, these moles of oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen, our goal is to get all of these to be integer values because that's really what we expect up here with our chemical formula. And the easiest way to get all of these to be integer values is to divide by the smallest number of moles. And then the smallest number of moles here are the moles of oxygen. So if we divide that by itself, that has to be equal to one. And what we wanna do with each of these is we wanna divide them all by the same number and if we're lucky, then they'll all come out to be integers. And if they're all integers, then our work is done. And we can turn that into an empirical formula. So when I do this for the carbon, I get 2.002. I'll round a little bit there. And 1.3019 divided by 0.2169 equals 5.998. So both of these, the question now is, are those close enough to integers or not? And what we're gonna say is that we can round to the nearest integer if we are within 0 0.1. And so is our 0 0.002 less than 0 0.1? Sure. So we're going to round that to 2, but we want to go ahead and write that number down first before we show that. And the 5.998, are we cl closer than 0 0.1 to 6? Sure we are. And so we will write that down, and then we'll round up to 6. So now coming back to our empirical formula, our chemical formula, we're always gonna write carbon first, then hydrogen, then oxygen. And what we've got here is we've got two carbons, six oxygens, and sorry, six hydrogens and one oxygen. So our empirical formula is C2H6O. Now, without knowing more about this compound, we can't really say specifically what it is, but there is a follow-up question to this, which is, was the unknown fuel more likely to be methanol or ethanol? And if we look at the formula that we found, we found for our empirical formula that we have two carbons. And so this must mean it's ethanol, if we know that we had an alcohol fuel that we were burning. So to go back over this and summarize, this is the most challenging kind of empirical formula you would ever see, which is called combustion analysis. But overall, our steps, our first step was really to convert 
given elements, or in this case, compounds, to moles of individual elements. And since this was combustion analysis, we had a little bit more work to go through to be able to get our moles of oxygen because we had to do the subtraction for our fuel with our grams of carbon and grams of hydrogen to get our grams of oxygen. But this is really the key is convert given elements or compounds to moles of individual elements. Our second step was to then divide by the smallest number of moles. And then round to nearest integer if within 0 0.1. So what are you gonna do if you're not within 0 0.1? Well, that's gonna be the next example. So we'll fill that in in a minute. Then the final step would be to rewrite chemical formula with subscripts, always in the order of carbon, hydrogen, and then increasing electronegativity. Or if you happen to have an ionic compound, then you would write the cation or metal first, and then the nonmetals in, again, order of increasing electronegativity. So here we have another question. What is the empirical formula of an unknown sample which contains by mass 84% carbon and 16% hydrogen? And I'm just rounding a little bit there. So I'm gonna go ahead and write these numbers down. 84.09% carbon and 15.91% hydrogen. Notice it's asking for empirical formula. And so our goal here is to compare the atoms of carbon in the sample to the atoms of hydrogen in order to be able to figure out the ratio for the formula, for the empirical formula. And if we look at our steps, our steps for finding empirical formulas our first step is to convert given elements and compounds to moles of individual elements. Well, here we're given percents. Does that really matter? This does not really matter because what we can do is we can assume a 100 gram sample, which means that we then have 84.09 grams of carbon in a 100 gram sample of this unknown material. Likewise, we have 15.91 grams of hydrogen if we have a 100 gram sample. And so even though we've got percents here, it doesn't matter. If we started with masses, we would work with the masses. If we started with milligrams, we would work for milligrams. It doesn't matter as long as we can convert these to moles. And if we have percents, we assume 100 grams for our sample. So now what we wanna do is convert this to moles of carbon. by dividing by the molar mass of carbon. We don't have to go through any other steps here because it's already just carbon. 
So all those extra steps before were really because it was combustion analysis. And so here now we can calculate eighty four point zero nine divided by twelve point oh one equals seven point zero zero two just about and fifteen point nine one divided by one point zero one equals Fifteen point seven five. Go one more two. The seven point zero zero two was just too perfect to leave it as it was. So now we have this many moles of carbon. We have this many moles of hydrogen. That's nice, and you might be tempted to stop here. But remember, we haven't quite compared our atoms yet. Once we've converted to moles of the individual elements, our next step is to divide by the smallest number of moles. And so between these two numbers, the smallest one is the moles of carbon. When we divide that by itself, we're always gonna get one. So one of these values should always come out to be one, at least in the beginning of these steps. This last one here, the 15.752 divided by 7.002 comes out and gives me 2.2497. And I could keep going. Now, this is where we would run, want to round the nearest integer. However, we are definitely not within 0 0.1 here. The decimal here is 0 0.2497, and we want to think about what fraction this is closest to. So if our fraction is 1 half, then we would just simply multiply everything by 2. But the decimal for 1 half is 0 0.5. Another common fraction that you might see in these kinds of questions is 1 third but that decimal would be 0 0.333 or something close to that. And then we would multiply by three, but that's not our decimal here. One fourth would be 0 0.25. And you should notice that this is almost exactly 0 0.25. So we're gonna multiply by four, but not only are we gonna multiply that one by four, we're gonna multiply any other element by four. So this means now that I've got four carbons and I've got nine hydrogens. So my empirical formula here would be C4H9 based off of the work. Some other fractions that might be important to know are one fifth, which would be 0 0.2. One sixth would be 0 0.1666, and one eighth would be 0 0.125. Again, now we're getting closer to the 0.1, and those would be less useful. Now, there's a follow on question to this one. So, we found our empirical formula. The follow on question gives us the molecular mass which can be found from a different experiment and asks about the molecular formula. Well, the empirical formula as defined is always based on empirical or ev experimental evidence. but it is also the lowest ratio between the elements. And so this C4H9 is the empirical formula because both of those are not divisible by common factors. 
if both of those were even, if we had C4H10, then this would not be the empirical formula because C2H5 would be the lowest ratio. So this is the definition of an empirical formula. Whereas a molecular formula, will always be exactly what's in the molecule. Or the compound. And so in this case, C4H10 is okay as a molecular formula, even though it's not the empirical formula because it would show us what's exactly what's in the molecule. Now you should notice the relationship between these two. The molecular formula could be larger than the empirical formula, but never the other way around. And so what we can do is we can take our molecular mass and we can compare, compare it to our empirical formula mass. And this will give me some sort of a factor. And so if there's a factor involved here, notice the factor here between C2H5 and C4H10 is a factor of two. If there's a factor here that tells me how much more of something there is in the molecule, then that's important to know and that's how, how I can take an empirical formula and find a molecular formula. And so in this follow-on question, we're told that our molecular mass is 114.26 AMU. So I'm gonna go ahead and write that down. 114.26 AMU. And I wanna divide that by the empirical formula mass. So all the way back up here, we found with this example that our empirical formula was C4H9. So if I have C4H9, that means that I've got four times 12.01 and nine times 1.01, or 57.13. And this would also be AMU per molecule, just as it would also be grams per mole. And so for this one, this one came out, this one was meant to come out this way, where if you look at those two numbers and you run the calculation, you find that the molecular formula is double the empirical formula. And so I take my C4H9 and I multiply by two to get C8H18, in other words, octane. And that would be the molecular formula for this compound. So again, the steps for determining an empirical formula are to convert the given elements or compounds to moles of individual elements. Then divide by the smallest number of moles. Round the nearest integer if within 0.1. If not, then you multiply by denominator of closest fraction and you multiply all elements, not just the one with the fraction. Finally, you rewrite the chemical formula with subscripts, carbon, hydrogen, and then in order of increasing electronegativity or the cation or metal first, and then anything else in order of increasing electronegativity. If you are asked about a molecular formula, in addition to an empirical formula, the molecular formula is always related to the empirical formula through some integer factor.
if you do that math and you don't get something extremely close to an integer, well, then that tells you that you either made an uh, error, a mistake in calculating your molar mass of the uh, empirical formula, or perhaps if you were conducting an experiment to measure the molecular mass, then there was something wrong with your experiment for the molecular mass, or there was something wrong in your work on the calculations to determine the empirical formula. You're gonna get some practice questions for these. Um, please look for those, and there will be another discussion section again on this topic.